So I viewed this, the echo is driving me crazy. I viewed this as a, uh, an update. Uh, so here I'll be just talking about everything that I'm involved in, which is a, a weird set to, subsets of cut. Sorry, I'm just trying to get invo just trying to get uh, my head around hearing my own voice one second after I say it. Okay, page two. So I'm involved in. Sorry. I'm going to have to turn this off. When, when you um, want to talk to me, say something in the chat so I can catch it. Okay. Okay. So everything that I'm working on is uh, toward a single goal. Um, and that goal is to increase the separation of concerns between physics and st physics, statistical analysis, and computing issues, so the data analysts can focus on data. Uh, but um, the idea of adding abstraction layers is not new, um, uh, and I have noticed that physicists don't often use them because they're unfamiliar, slow, or poorly advertised. So then, as a means to the above, uh, I'm first of all developing projects in stages so that small improvements can be rolled out before radically new interfaces. Um, uh, maybe the, the main point here, ensuring high performance so that speed is the first selling point to attract physicists to use these new products. Um, um, I'll be talking a lot about speed, but uh, really, I'm just seeing this as a means to an end. Page six. And then the third point is I really need to be advertising this more, um, but in the uh, currently, I don't have um, projects that make sense to put in front of users. Uh, so I will be doing this soon, but uh, rest assured it, it is coming. So uh, then I collected everything that I've been working on into something like a timeline. You see in 2016, a lot of references to Spark. In 2017, a lot of references to querying, uh, and that's intentional. Um, also in 27, a lot of references to um, uh, working with columns, columns of data, which is the thing that I think uh, is the reason that we, uh, um, that I'm not expecting we'll be able to just use Spark alone. Uh, that we'll have to augment it in order to be able to work with it uh, uh, the way that we want to. All right, so page eight. Now, what do I mean by columnar data? Because uh, we've been using columnar data for years now, where the, the root file format splits objects, even nested hierarchical objects into uh, columns for storage. Uh, what I'm talking about that's new here is doing calculations directly on these columnar arrays without reconstructing events and particles first. So um, to illustrate by example, uh, suppose that you wanted to write the code on the left. Uh, this is very physicist friendly code. Um, well, for one thing, it's in Python. Um, but for another, it is referring to events and muons and uh, muon objects like M1 and M2 as objects. Uh, you know. Um, things that you type dot and get its attributes. Um, but in order to uh, do very fast calculations on this, you'd rather the data be stored in columns um, so that uh, the code that runs at runtime is uh, um, doing numerical operations over arrays rather than um, operations on literal objects in memory. So um, this project that I've been developing that is used to be the guts of Femta code, but now pulled out into something that can be applied to uh, conventional languages like Python, uh, is it takes that object-based code and translates it to a form 
where uh, the code is actually just accessing elements of arrays and it can run very fast. Well, for one thing, if it's just accessing elements of arrays, uh, we can use a, a package called NumBud to compile it because NumBud knows about arrays and numbers and it doesn't know about Python objects. So by removing all the Python objects and just having a bunch of array and, uh, references, we can actually compile the Python code. Uh, the plot on the right is for four different algorithms. This one is the third. Um, uh, performance, higher is better, um, compared to doing a make class type thing in C++. Um, part, uh, large part of the uh, performance gain is coming from Brian's bulk I.O. Uh, and he was a co-author on this. Uh, uh, but then the analytics that you want to do doesn't get in the way after that. And that's the point here. Uh, interestingly, the uh, the mass calculation is the slowest, and if you try to find out why it's slower than the other uh, sample calculations, it's because of calculating cosine and cosh. We're actually at the level where that sort of thing matters. So this has been submitted to IEEE. I'll hear back uh, the 9th of uh, October, and uh, this is the subject of my strange talk. So I'll be presenting this to in industry also because uh, I think they haven't seen things like this either. So page 11. Uh, beyond the um, uh, speed performance, there's also a storage uh, advantage to be gained if these columns of data are um, like first class objects in the data management system. So um, if we have an open API uh, that um, uh, is not just uh, the way that root serializes things, which is, would be considered sort of an internal thing, but if it's an open API with a specification for how uh, sets of arrays represent nested objects, uh, we could actually manage data as arrays rather than as objects or, or even as files um, and get some and get the ability to to share data among versions because when a version changes. Oh, the, the new things in it are often just, uh, um, you know, jet energy corrections have been updated or something, and that would be just one column updated. You can even do dramatic restructuring of your data like this. So suppose that we had some flat list of events um, that you could represent with brackets, event, 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 uh, and you can uh, change its structure even, turning it into like a nested list of Lumi blocks without touching the event column. So all of the data associated with each of those events, and you know, that's nearly all the data, is untouched. And you can have two versions of the data. One is structured as Lumi blocks and another is structured as events. Uh, and they share 99.9% .9 of the data. Uh, more than that, um, Users can correct gen energies, add reconstructed candidates, link gen and reco, skim particles, uh, and make all of these manipulations on, on the structure of the data, the content and structure of the data, uh, without making separate copies. Uh, the data set versions would all share content like Git and GitHub. So that's, that's sort of the vision where this is going. Now, uh, another thing that this opens up is um, database style indexing. Uh, I'm working with Tanu Malik, uh, database expert in the CS department at DePaul. In particular, she is interested in the idea of applying database style indices to hierarchical data, uh, which, as far as you can find, has never been done. Um, and it, it very much helps having the data in columns to do this. So some ideas uh, like approximate indexing with zone maps and bitmaps, also sorting events to concentrate high PT uh, events, events with high PT particles in the first few disk pages. Um, we're just beginning to, to figure out some ideas. Um, her knowledge of the literature was such that she was actually able to find prior art, uh, certainly not in HEP, but in, um, in uh, database field talking about SQL. Um, where uh, 
um, people have been developing columnar objects to improve the performance of analytic ap applications. So we're, you know, barking up the right tree here, uh, although we're doing some things that this prior art isn't. So this could be uh, written as an extension of that. Uh, we're also developing a community white paper on this. Um, so for me, uh, short-term goals for, for what to do about col columnar computing is uh, in the next few weeks or month, um, I intend to get this in front of physicists. Uh, so finish these uh, the plur tools um, for physicists to be able to run Python functions on their local skimmed data. So this first stage doesn't have anything to do with querying a distributed system. Um, but it'll get a lot of the machinery onto something that physicists already have and already wants to accelerate. Uh, and then the goal of this, the, the selling point, would be to make it faster than conventional C++ methods. So what is needed for this? Well, reading root with Brian's bulk I.O. Uh, and then that through my NumPy interface on top of that. Um, have the ability for the physicist to create new columns uh, and someday uh, database indices in, in an SSD cache, assuming they have SSD on their laptop or wherever they're running it. Um, transforming the Python code with Plur compiled to Numba for the uh, execution speed. Uh, and then also using bulk IO and Plur friendly data tiers like CMS's, CMS's Nano AOD. That's why I was interested, why I'm interested in that. And the longer term goal, this is on the order of a year, uh, develop a, a demonstrator of a HEP query service. So the physicist can submit Python code to a server. It runs on many nodes in parallel and returns small objects like histograms. Uh, and so that whole process of submitting the job, computing and getting results must be uh, at the scale of one second, uh, human time scale, to be a reasonable competitor to local skims. Um, and so, of course, this is why all this focus on performance. I'm working with Ali and Igor on the LDRD project, uh, incorporating ideas from Tanat's summer study, uh, still hoping to work with off-the-shelf pieces as much as possible for the uh, distributed part of it. Um, to do all of this, I've been contributing to Root and CMS. Uh, for Root, uh, I've been putting a NumPy interface on top of bulk I.O. This will get data into scientific Python libraries like machine, Pandas, machine learning, et cetera, more rapidly, not just Plur, although that's my reason for doing it. Um, uh, full integration with PyRoot, that's done, and then high-level connectors to common Python libraries like Pandas or TensorFlow, that's planned. For CMS, um, I've been testing Nano AOD to make sure that it's bulk I.O. capable and also Plur capable, uh, and so far it is. I've been performance testing the Nano AOD with bulk I.O., uh, particularly uh, uh, how it deals with uh, the new LZ4 compression and other experimental features like Brian's uh, offset removal. <clears throat> so this will be both useful feedback both to the Nano AOD group about specifically how their um, data tier performs and also root I.O. about how a typical uh, data tier form, uh, performs. Now, it would be great if there were a similar movement in Atlas, a movement similar to Nano AOD within Atlas. Uh, I've been uh, trying to work with the DX AODs, but these are all <coughs> standard vectors, which in the bulk IO language is destructively serialized, so we can't actually work with it in bulk IO. Uh, yet, it has the sem same semantic information as a tea leaf of N, so it would be nice to be able to present Atlas the same way. You know, just some different technology choices. <clears throat> um, yeah, in addition to that, uh, uh, I developed an alternate root reader. So the, the bulk IO NumPy inter API is simple enough, I don't even look at the streamers or classes, uh, that it can be implemented in pure Python uh, so that we could do this without root as a dependency, particularly without uh, a future version of root that users would have to currently compile from source as a dependency. Um, and so it, it, it does basically the same thing as bulk IO and, and has similar performance, uh, but of course it's easier to install. 
Um, uh, and this project has small scope. It's never intended to go beyond uh, bulk I.O. type stuff. So conclusions. Uh, I'm working on many different projects with many different people, uh, but these projects are all connected. We're developing a high-level analysis environment with a performance gain, not a cost. Uh, doing a staged approach, so first developing tools for a that analysts can use on their existing skims, then uh, providing the same interface on a distributed service so they don't have to make skims anymore, uh, and then vectorization and type checking gains from femtocode, which I didn't even talk about here because that's, that's beyond that. Um, and a combination of uproot with this uh, bulk IO NumPy style interface Plur and Histogrammer should be ready, physicists ready in some weeks, uh, maybe a month. Uh, so then I'll respond to feedback and iterate. Uh, any questions? I've got my headphones on now. Hi, Jim. Here's Peter. Um, Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, what is this thing of you said that is integrated with uh, PyRoot? At which level? Yeah. Um, the uh, bulk I.O. to NumPy interface is integrated with PyRoot in the sense that you use, uh, you, you can use PyRoot objects to get the NumPy arrays. So for instance, if you have a T-tree, you can ask for it one of its T branches, and then ask for an array of that T branch. Which is, is very similar to what they do now with the T data frame, if at all, isn't it? Oh, no. No? No, the T data frame is giving a functional interface to doing processing. Uh, and so it focuses on the process, uh, what you compute, and first and then we compute next and we compute next. Yes, um, but you can, but an action can be just get me this column. Okay, it could be. And does it output NumPy? Uh, it outputs probably a, a vector of doubles, if the column is a double. <laughs> and then this you get, uh, you can fill, a, you, you can pass that to a, to a NumPy. I don't know, we have to yeah. double check. But it's certainly Th this is all um, pretty different. I think that maybe you could make a Venn diagram where they have some overlap, but uh, they're mostly not overlapping. Okay. And, and pray that um, it's that not a competitor to T-Data Frame at all. It, it, and the other thing to, to note that even within the overlap, I think there's uh, Are you there? one one thing that they I'm need to... I'm not hearing anybody anymore. Oh, I can hear you, Jim. Can people hear me? Oh, I think it might just be on, on Jim's side. I'm back. Uh, you know, the, the other thing to note is there might be a real big difference in performance scales here. Um, last I saw, T data frame overheads are very noticeable at about uh, uh, a kilohertz or... or and a lot of things that Jim's looking at right now are on the order of uh, a megahertz to to uh, plus. So um, I, I think we need – one of the things that I, I really want to talk to Danilo and uh, uh, folks about is, you know, trying to think about what T data frame looks like <laughs> three order magnitude faster. Okay, I, I encourage that really you, you discuss because I think what we should not do, even, even if there is a little overlap, we should not, uh, we should try to, to minimize it, okay? Oh, yeah. They, they, they can't get rid of me. Other questions? I have a question about slides not it's being presented slide 10. Okay. Is, is this an example of a code that users might write like a defined function like time even? Yes. 
with four loops and give it to Clara. Yes. You, and you, ultimately you, you to the query system. Like a users, you don't expect users write like a vectorized code. Right. Uh, whether the Okay. So whether the code is vectorized or not is definitely uh, computing detail, uh, something that you shouldn't be thinking about if you're trying to think about statistical analysis or, or physics. Um, so as much as possible, we would try to auto-vectorize. I see. Like uh, if some, somebody is already familiar with you know, writing vectorized code, you know, writing, going back to, going back and writing nested for loops is, you know, got more, got, might be more cumbersome than writing vectorized code for some users, I thought. Well, a query language, and here we're using Python as a query language, is like a replacement for SQL. It's It's really, very far from where you should be thinking about vectorization. Oh, I, I mean, I, maybe you know, I was, I was, think, I'm thinking that something very simple. Like here, so M1, the M1 PT, uh, and M2, M1 PT here is just the one number because it's in a in a loop. Mm -hmm. But uh, you can start with the M1 PT as a array of PTs of all new ones in the event. Uh, and then, you know, you get the second. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm just saying that this is a very different application. When you are submitting queries, um, uh, well, basically, you shouldn't be thinking about that. OK. OK. Like, if you're interested in that sort of thing, then you could help work on the back end. Mm -hmm. But but uh, these are the sorts of things computers should do for you, unless you're writing some very optimized algorithm for the trigger, and then that's not the use case for this at all. Okay. Oh, well, um, sorry. So, so so the other reason to make users kind of try and think about the vectorization is uh, essentially is, uh, similar computation syntax to like pandas data frames. Right. I mean, this is mostly for our students um, to just l learn the uh, modern uh, data processing methods, if you so want. And for loops is, uh, well, quite different to that. Right. Um, and the reason that you need to have for loops at all is because you're dealing with nested hierarchical data, which is not something that you have in pandas although the the, the bottom of the screen here uh, introduced uh, presenting this uh, to industry uh, I've been trying to get them to have more support for uh, nested hierarchical data this is the reason I feel that spark won't work for us out of the box it's, you know they have all these optimizations for working with flat trees or flat and tuples type things. Um, uh, and so therefore, if, if you're teaching students to uh, write a function, a pandas function, uh, because that has the vectorization implicit in it, uh, that won't be possible when pandas starts supporting things like objects. But until it starts supporting things like objects, we won't be able to express something like uh, computing uh, an invariant mass, because you have to pick two particles somehow. You said nested hierarchical 
data, it means if it's PT is in the muon object and if it's in turn is in the event object, that kind of hierarchical structure. Yeah, that's the hierarchical structure. Yeah. Okay. Um, incidentally, the Femta code that I didn't talk about um, uh, tries to incorporate um, enough information about the objects that it can automatically flatten to apply those vectorized optimizations like the one you were talking about, like exactly the one you were talking about. Yeah, I would yeah, I would have array for the E the array for five, array for P T and then they all have the same length because they come from the same length yeah. as number of muons and then yeah, start with vectorized score. Yeah. And that works in this simple example. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, as soon as you start having to pick a particle from here and a particle from there with some cuts on them uh, and go through uh, gen rico uh, matching. Um, uh, it gets more difficult to find where you can apply the vectorization. And so it would be great if that was just automatically calculated. Anyway, um, are there other questions? Um, because if not, I think I've run over. Okay, thanks, Jim. Um, and then next we had uh, uh, Victor on the agenda. Victor, you're there. Can you, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yes. So can go ahead. Uploaded the slides. I'm going to project them in a second. Um. <clears throat> Okay, I think you should be able to see the slides right now. Um, previously, when I presented the last time at Diana, it was, I was a student, uh, so now I'm <coughs> working as a fellow at Open Lab. Um, the project I'm involved with is called Deepest, um, and I'm going to try to introduce it to you here quickly. Um, so the outline is quite simple. I would like to answer three questions with this, and. Uh, give a little bit of a um, actually outline, not an idea, but an outline of what I'm going to be contributing towards. So first of all, I would like to introduce what Deepest is and it will going to be because it's going to only be built uh, in the future. Um, I will, I will uh, briefly uh, touch upon uh, what's currently available. I'm going to be part of CMS um, and for that matter, I would like to briefly outline what the benefits for CMS and for SORNA in that respect. And I would like also, I will give some ideas of what projects I will be involved with at this stage at least. So moving forward, uh, page three, um, what is deepest in principle? Um, there is a, this is an acronym, uh, just dynamic exascale entry platform, etc. So the most important pro point here is that it's a third generation of the D project. So that was the, it's a EU funded project uh, which in principle aims to build a um, supercomputer, supercomputer architecture, in this case modular. Uh, and I'll mention what it is in a bit as well. Uh, the main idea here is to have heterogeneity of resources. By that I mean processors, coprocessors, uh, and other units, processing units. Um, so basically that's an idea. An idea is to build a cluster which consists out of uh, heterogeneous resources. Uh, there are various components in here. Uh, this is third generation. They are targeting specifically analytics, data analytics in this case. Um, and there are three main components which will be, which uh, deepest will consist of. That's cluster module, which consists mainly out of CPUs. Uh, uh, there is a booster module, 
which will consist or it's not this might change a bit but at this stage it is the way it planned it will consist out of co-processors the next generation after KNLs is KNHs, uh, Knights, Knights Hills. Um, I don't know in what form it will come as co-processor or as a socket, uh, the motherboard socket processor. This is not determined yet, 100%, but that's what it is. Um, and the third module is data analytics module. Uh, the idea here is uh, there will be a bunch of memory. Exactly the number, I don't know. This is not specified 100%. Basically, there will be processing units with a um, huge amount of memory. Per, per single core. So, again, numbers are not specified 100% yet, so it's not clear. Um, so, moving forward, um, what is the deepest going to be? Uh, this slide, <coughs> this diagram, is supposed to basically provide information about the prototype, the initial prototype which will be built. Uh, again, in circles, you, you see three different modules. Uh, which are going to be constructed. I already specified them in the previous slide. Um, it's not quite clear what different, what other components are going to be. For example, in the bottom left, there is a network attached memory. The application. Uh, you can utilize this memory. This memory is supposed to be uh, supposed to be on the network, in principle. So, like I said, this is a higher level overview of that. So, not quite clear what's going to be. But uh, the point is that deepest um, will build this prototype and use CMS software in this case, uh, CMS software to as a uh, the way to benchmark uh, the way to uh, test. Is one of the basic applications to this particular architecture. Uh, so moving forward, how does CMS and CERN uh, participate, or what's the benefit for us in general? So the idea is that there are actually six applications that participate. Uh, so besides of just building the, the system, there are six applications, scientific applications like neuroscience, weather analytics, uh, biology, HEP. Uh, six different applications are participating in this project. CMS is a new member. Like I said, this is the third generation of the project. Uh, and these people, uh, the other applications have been participating for the past uh, basically six years. And they will be participating for another three. Uh, but CMS and SORN are basically a new member of this, uh, of this list. What do they want? They actually want CMS to provide various workflows to run on their system. Uh, by workflows here, I mean digitization, reconstruction, uh, particle flow track and um, basically that analysis as well. They don't know actually. On their side, they're building the system without the knowledge of what kind of physics workforce we're going to run. What we provide them are requirements basically of our applications and that's it. Uh, that's an idea. Moving forward uh, on this slide, <coughs> page six, you can uh, find a summary of kind of what kind of hardware is currently available. For the most part, you can you will find here either processors or coprocessors, um, and uh, no particular no other accelerators like GPUs or FPGAs at this point yet, which have been um, declared in the proposal. But uh, yeah, basically that's what they have right now, and in the future they sh they will have uh, basically more. But we can use what they have already um, for various purposes. So that's just for the reference. Page seven. <clears throat> so, what's the benefit from deepest for the CMS? Uh, an idea from my side. I don't want just. Oh, we do not want just benchmark CMS at all. Obviously, um, we would like to contribute to the development of the software for the next uh, two, three years, basically. More, more specifically, I mean, it's me. One fellow will be working on, on this R and D on the R and D part of the CMS software ecosystem, uh, which targets high luminosity LHC. This one fellow is me, basically. So I'll be working full time. Uh, as I already mentioned, and I, I think it's important for us, uh, deepest is agnostic about the HTTP workflows. Uh, why it's important? Because it allows us um, it allows us to test and run whatever we want, in principle, as application, uh, various workflows, uh, various pipelines, whatever we want to test, basically. Also for us, what's important, I mean, nice of course, we, we get a bunch of hardware that we can play around with. 
uh, or pro it's not yet there, but promise to be. Um, I think that's um, important as well. And obviously collaboration with other sciences outside of energy physics, so which is uh, very interesting because you get exposed basically. So uh, this is the final slide. Here it's, uh, I summarize briefly two ideas which I'll be contributing towards at this point. Uh, the first one is CMS Big Data Project, uh, which Mateo will introduce afterwards. Uh, and uh, here I will basically uh, contribute towards uh, various pipelines for Apache Spark, given that IO is written for that part. Um, root IO is working and um, we are currently testing it on analytics Hadoop cluster here, so, so I'll be working on that. Uh, that's number one. Number two is uh, the deepest project itself is about heterogeneity. Ah, one thing I forgot to mention. So deepest itself, uh, by introducing this data analytics component, uh, they would like to embrace uh, big data, big data tools, big data platforms which come from the industry, by which Spark uh, and uh, machine learning pipelines also come in. Basically, it's not quite clear what they're going to select to be uh, to be utilized uh, in the future, but um, there is an interest in this direction. So this is why I think uh, contribution to the CMS Big Data Project is important uh, for me. Um, now, another thing is that, like I said, deepest is about heterogeneity. I mentioned it many times. Uh, I will not go into details, so I don't have them at this point, but basically I'll be working on the, trying to make CMS software framework more uh, heterogeneous, aware, more aware of the heterogeneous resources. Um, I will only start on that soon, so more news later, I guess, but that's an idea at least towards, uh, that's, a, that's a direction which I'll, I'm going to work. So that's it from my side in principle. If there are any questions, please let me know. I wanted to briefly describe uh, my project. So, uh, sorry, I was out for a second. So, um, Victor, you're, you're going to come back in one of the subsequent meetings, correct, and talk a bit about... Yes, I, I'll probably be coming back to these meetings as well, quite regularly at this point. Um, so. I mean, for the, for the others, essentially, Deepest is an opportunity sort of in the same space where, where Victor can will be involved, and the question is how to make sure that the projects... Uh, it's all sort of coherent, so even though you're kind of put on the spot to make a fairly early presentation while the plan is still being put together. So, Yeah, that's why I think it's um, also good. If you guys have any ideas, please bring them up. Um, um. So, so is the, the idea to start doing like a, a down select, you know, you, you – kind of uh, put out a couple really broad ranging things here. Are, are you trying, is it the next step to move them to a smaller, more finite set of work items for the next three years? Uh, I would say for the, to be very concrete, for the, for the big data from, from the Apache Spark standpoint, what I'm working on right now is I'm transferring a few pipelines from uh, traditional way of doing it into basically doing it with Apache Spark and that's it. Uh, a few pipelines, one of them is basically one of the analysis that I was involved with. Uh, I will translate it completely. A few machine learning pipelines I'll translate uh, and see how they perform basically. Um, an idea is to go to, because I did a lot of tests with one, one terabyte, two terabytes and these kind of things, but the idea is I will go and try to do 100 terabytes analysis, uh, see how it scales, what we can do about EOS because we can now read it from EOS as well. That's from uh, CMS Big Data standpoint. Uh, from the deeper side, um, I mean, I'm not new to CMS, but I'm new, I'm new to contribute to the CMS software framework itself. And um, in, this, in this direction, uh, there is, a, I would say, there is a, uh, we have identified potential <clears throat> direction already, one that I'll be working on. Um, but at this point, I would like not to bring more because I just don't have more, so.
I maybe say in a month I'll be able to identify exact, exactly tell you what I'm going to be working technically wise. But at this point, I don't want to. But if you have more ideas in, in the sense of what what else, uh, given the given the uh, this description of the project and given uh, the outline of within which I'm going to be working, with, um, if you have more ideas, please bring them up. Uh, so. Okay, thanks, Victor. Um, should maybe move on to Matteo. Matteo, you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me fine? Yeah. So go ahead. Your slides like, are up, so the people may have to hit reload to get them from Indigo. But okay. Go ahead. So this is an overview of the CMS and Intel Big Data projects. Uh, as we will see during uh, down down in the slides, uh, there are two parallel trusts as we started calling them, uh, one of them fully funded, uh, uh, supported uh, by, by Intel, but both of them falling into the larger group of people called CMS Big Data Project uh, um, that started in 2015 uh, to solve, uh, let's say, a specific, very painful uh, problem in particle physics uh, that I'll start discussing in the next slide. So this talk is actually just an overview. I'm not going to give any technical details. I'm going to describe uh, which is the problem we want to solve, uh, which is the plan, uh, which are the achievements that we um, achieved uh, so far, uh, and uh, which is the plan for, for the next steps. So as we all know, uh, we are all experimental particle physicists, but I mean, from the computing perspective, uh, uh, the plot that is, a, that is on slide number two, that is a very important plot for, uh, for science, is the discovery of the Higgs boson. What does that mean? Uh, in particle physics, we detect particle interactions uh, that constitute you know, the detector data, that are the black dots on the, uh, on the plot, uh, and we pretty much just compare them with whatever is our theory prediction, that is the simulation, the about the blue shape that is of uh, no physical processes, or the red shape that is the simulation of a new theory, in this case, the Higgs, uh, the time of the discovery, was still not part of the, uh, of the, of the, um, you know, the known processes. Moving on to slide number three, uh, particle Mate detection. Mate Matteo, yes. are you sharing the slides yourself? No. Can you? I can try. Just give me one second, because it does not always work. Uh, 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 uh. Just give me a second. Yeah. Uh. Sorry, it looks like it's not working. Let me do one more attempt. There you go. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Go ahead. Yeah. Let me come back here. So, and do this. And um, so we were on slide number two, and uh, I was uh, was describing which is our goal, uh, and uh, as particle physicists, how we should see this from the the computing perspective. Pretty much, we would like to compare two things: uh, the data that we are able to record uh, to the to record uh, through the, the the particle detector with the simulation that we need to produce in order to possibly find uh, a new physics process like the Higgs boson production. So on slide number three, and can you see the slide number three now? Just for confirmation, yes, you can. Yeah. Um, so, uh, how we uh, get the data events? Uh, I mentioned before part that the, wor the, the um, words particle detection. Uh, particle detection means pretty much record physics quantities uh, like energy or the flight part of the particles uh, that are produced in a collision. So these uh, quantities measured from the interaction of particles at the uh, and, and the different detector components are of the order of 
a million individual measurements. All these measurements together constitute what we uh, call uh, an event. And uh, the concept of event is really important because pretty much the uh, road, the way we do analysis in particle physics for the past, I guess, 40 years, uh, and this is something we have to deal with if we would like to apply new technology in, uh, in particle physics analysis, somehow preventing, the, um, preserving this concept, uh, but modifying it in order not to be limited by it. Uh, slide number four is just uh, uh, a view of what is an event. So that this is, um, uh, this is the, a, 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 the CMS detector, and when a collision happens, uh, all these things happen inside the detector and constitute all the information that we need to deal with in order to define an event and analyze it. Moving on to slide number five, uh, the scientific process is then described in this, uh, in this diagram. So we have the science device that is the detector that gets, uh, that records the data, records the data. Then we have, uh, let's say, an online selection of these events called trigger, and of course the data acquisition is a step in front of it. And then we have a, a big blue box uh, that is uh, computing the software that stands in between uh, all, all you can do at the hardware level and your scientific output. So compute, software and computing is uh, uh, crucial to the capability of producing science in a particle physics experiment. And um, if we spend a couple of minutes on uh, event reconstruction, uh, since we stress uh, uh, the importance of the event concept so far, um, so detector signal needs to be reconstructed uh, in order to learn something about the particles that uh, have been produced in an event and the way they interact with the detector. Uh, and uh, eventually, the reconstructed events are the ones that are used in the analysis. And also, the level of the reconstruction, a huge computing uh, uh, effort uh, stands behind in order to do it properly and uh, get the most out of it. And um, so going further on slide number seven, uh, um, let's focus on what is computing uh, and software. Uh, the blue box uh, I mentioned before, uh, we receive uh, raw data from either the device, uh, so the, C the CMS detector in this case, uh, or the simulation that as mentioned before is uh, an important ingredient in order to be compared to the data and possibly find uh, new, new physics processes. The both of them should uh, uh, be reconstructed, so a uh, huge computational effort is put, is put in order to use proper algorithms to reconstruct, to reconstruct simulated or uh, detector data. And eventually, we have uh, uh, the analysis software that should be optimized in order to, uh, in the shortest possible time, produce what we need, and what we need eventually are numbers or results and plots like the one that was shown in my very first slide. Slide number eight, uh, we see uh, how currently the situation is. So the first two steps of uh, software and computing are centralized. It, it means that uh, um, they are organized in, the, in a very strict way inside the collaboration with proper people they take care of uh, uh, getting the data, reconstructing it, and producing, uh, uh, and producing in, uh, a, form, a data format that is suitable for physics analysis. Uh, and all of this is happen centrally. The step that stands behind that is as important as the first step, the one that eventually uh, gives you whatever it goes into a physics paper, is still chaotic. It means that there are a bunch of order of 50 different uh, analysis groups, uh, even more uh, in CMS, uh, uh, with uh, several different uh, uh, analysis codes, uh, with outdated technologies, uh, uh, and uh, this is becoming uh, and can become a limiting factor, especially if we look in perspective uh, uh, when the data volume is going to grow. And uh, on slide number nine, we can see the plan of, uh, of, of the LSC. And we can see how the luminosity, so pretty much the amount of data that we need to deal with is gonna grow with the different runs of the accelerator. So right now we are in run two, but uh, looking further, especially in the era of the luminosity LHC, uh, the luminosity is gonna grow exponentially. And so we need to start uh, thinking about how should we should deal with such a large uh, amount of data. On slide number 10, 
uh, it, this is pretty much in petabytes, uh, uh, what converted in petabytes, uh, what we have just seen in, 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 the, in the luminosity plot. Uh, look at the, at the beam corresponding to our luminosity LHC. Uh, I mean, uh, it's pretty impressive what we should expect to deal with in the next years. And we, uh, we of course, don't want to lose uh, the capability to extract physics results, uh, and this uh, will, uh, will require a more organized uh, and a more coherent approach to physics analysis. Uh, as is said in the slide, we, not, we cannot support ca chaos anymore. Uh, what we can do, we can explore uh, the utilization of uh, industry technologies uh, as a suitable candidate for, users, for user analysis. Particle physics has been the, on the forefront of uh, you know, having the largest possible uh, uh, data sets to be dealt with uh, for years. Uh, that is not the case anymore. Uh, in industry, they started dealing with uh, far larger data sets and they, they developed uh, suitable technologies in order to deal with that. Uh, when we started thinking about that two years ago, uh, it was natural, natural thinking that uh, this time we should be the one learning from the outside and uh, pretty much uh, apply technologies that are already in use, in use outside into the field of particle physics. This is, of course, not straightforward, and I guess uh, Jim has already uh, mentioned uh, more technically uh, why it's not always uh, straightforward, uh, this application. Um, but that is the reason why I would, uh, really would like to explore them and try to go around all the possible limitations that we can find down the road. And uh, so let's start again by describing which is the current analysis workflow that is uh, more or less shared uh, by all the different analyses in CMS. As I said, there are order of 50, 60 different analysis groups uh, using different codes, but pretty much all of them are following the uh, same paths as described on slide number 11. So usually the input then, is a centrally produced output of reconstruction software um, that is already reduced, uh, uh, the, its content is already reduced in order to be opti optimized for, uh, for the analysis, and all the CMS reconstruction receipts are already applied but it's still too big for interactive analysis. Uh, this is, comes back to three years ago when the CMS collaboration uh, put a lot of effort in order to go from AOD to mini-AOD, and mini stands uh, behind the idea of uh, reducing as much as possible the event content, still too big to think about doing analysis out of it. So each single analysis group uh, is uh, using the first step of entuplizing, uh, where the format is converted uh, in a most, more suitable um, way in order to, um, to go towards doing interactive analysis, but it's still too big, because ev um, at this step, usually you rerun the CMS uh, uh, software in order to reconstruct quantities that you need for your own analysis, and uh, of course you reduce the event content, uh, but still it's not enough in order to have a plot in minutes out of the output of this first entoplasing step. And then we have to go through at least other two steps. One, one that is, uh, um, constitutes, constitu is constituted by scheming and slimming, and these two terms are pretty much, uh, means pretty much dropping events or branches in a disk to disk copy of the input data set in order to make it smaller. And then we have a final step of filtering and pruning uh, that is selectively reading events or bran on branches into memory. And this is what uh, eventually gives you the numbers out of a fit uh, for, uh, for an exotic signal uh, or a plot where a new peak can show up. Um, moving on to slide number 12, uh, this is uh, how uh, the CMS Big Data Project is currently organized. Uh, uh, as mentioned uh, briefly in the very first slide, uh, two trusts. We have a usability study where we would like to investigate an end-to-end -end -to -end, um, approach to conduct CMS physics analysis in Apache Spark. And the goal, the final goal here is producing uh, publication quality plots and tables from real CMS data. Um, we have a second trust that, of course, is uh, heavily overlapping with the first one, but it's in principle a different thing. That is the CMS Data Reduction Facility. That is a, it's a CERN open, uh, open Lab Intel project where we would like to demonstrate the reduction capabilities producing uh, analysis entables using Apache Spark. 
So the goal here is to reduce one petabyte of input to one terabyte of output in five hours. Um, at this stage, uh, applying official receipts or running CMS framework code uh, is currently not being considered because it's uh, a technically tough uh, or, uh, I mean, uh, heavily uh, convoluted uh, effort uh, uh, that is not at this stage of the project uh, crucial in order to uh, accomplish successfully one of the two trusts. Uh, let me spend a couple of uh, more words uh, uh, describing the differences between these two trusts. So for trust one, we are not planning to start from the centrally produced uh, CMS data format uh, from MiniOD, but we are planning to start uh, from uh, uh, the output of the first uh, and to plotting step of whatever analysis code. And we would like to do that because we would like to prove that uh, everything that stands uh, be, uh, after uh, this first step, uh, skimming and slimming or pruning and filtering, uh, can be done more efficiently with uh, new tools uh, in order to have a plot in uh, a reasonable amount of time with the same quality but with a less uh, painful uh, effort uh, to be put by usually students in order to make the code work. So the CMS data reduction facility, of course, has a slightly different approach. We start from uh, public CMS data, so from AOD, from run one, and we would like to show how fast we can be in order to accomplish uh, the one petabyte to one terabyte reduction. Uh, on slide number 13, I'm going to mention briefly uh, which are uh, uh, the technical developments uh, that allow us today to think about successfully accomplish the the two trusts described before. And I'm going to go through these quite quickly because uh, a couple of them have already been described by Jim and a couple of them are actually uh, Diana projects. So we are just users of these uh, technical developments that are still crucial. And I'd like to uh, be able to understand, uh, to, to make you understand how crucial they are in order to get the goal that we have. So the first, the first one is histogrammar. And uh, histogrammar is, a, is the package that we would like to use to produce histograms, uh, not relying on root anymore, and in order to have um, publication quality plots uh, out of CMS data. Uh, this is very important since uh, um, we lose the concept of event loop. So the event is still, uh, is still uh, an important concept, as mentioned before, but we can rely on the fact that uh, Spark manages concurrencies uh, so that uh, we do not have to do loop, loops anymore. So histogram is designed for MapReduce environment. It fills histograms by passing lambda functions, and that is the same as transformations in Spark. So once we have histograms, uh, we can uh, convert into plots by using uh, whatever uh, plotting tool we can. Uh, that can be uh, that can be still in, in Python or in or Boca as, as, as developed by uh, Alexei last year. Moving on, one of the um, difficult points we found uh, for uh, uh, the first round of the CMS Big Data project in 2016 uh, was dealing with the input data sets. So input are usually in root, uh, either the centrally produced file, uh, like MiniOD, MiniOD are root files, or uh, the, analysis, uh, the analysis group entables are still root files. Uh, we had to uh, deal with the fact that uh, root is not uh, the most appropriate format in order to work in Apache Spark environment. Um, the very first approach was converting them in Avro, and this is, of course, uh, expensive, both in time and in resources, uh, and it was not going into the direction to make it uh, uh, elastic enough in order to do interactive analysis. But the breakthrough here was the development of uh, uh, Spark root, so the capability of read root files directly in Apache Spark. This connects root to Apache Spark in order to make it able to read uh, root T3s and infer the schema, as you can see on the on the sketch from, uh, from, from Victor on the, on the slide, and uh, so that we can manipulate the data via Spark data frames there as it's on RPDs. So this is a very important step. It was a milestone for this year, and uh, it, it, it opened up a lot of a huge uh, amount of possibilities in order to make this project really work. And moving on on uh, slide number 15, uh, this is the latest development that is coming from uh, um, the um, Trust 2 um, um, approach from the Intel project uh, where uh, an Hadoop XLD connector was finally developed. So here, which is uh, it's another uh, problem of dealing with input data. So 
you, you need to have input data on the HDFS in order to work in Apache Spark environment. Uh, and this means transferring files around, and it's, of course, uh, uh, not what you want to do. Uh, CMS, once the mini ODR produced, they are stored on the OS at CERN. So enabling uh, the capability to read uh, directly the centrally produced files uh, through the net uh, is, a, is a crucial aspect in order to make the whole workflow faster. Uh, so this connector was, uh, was um, developed by VAG at CERN and um, performs uh, really well. Uh, performance tests have already been performed and uh, comparisons with uh, uh, reading files through the Hadoop S3D connector and HDFS have already been performed. Reading from the HDFS is uh, currently faster by a factor of two or, or three, but uh, some more tuning and optimization are expected to eventually close the gap between, between the two different approaches. And then leads to my conclusion. This was just, again, an overview of uh, what is the CMS Big Data Project. The group was created at the end of 2015 in, collab in a collaboration between Fermi Lambda, Yana Hef, and uh, CERN IT. And we have a website where you can find uh, uh, all the information, the milestones, the talk, and the uh, publications that we were able to produce in the past uh, two, two years. The project is rapidly expanding. Uh, we are gaining um, interest for, from more institutions like University of Padova, University of Bristol that recently joined. CERN Oper Lab enables partnership with industry, and uh, project called CMS Data Reduction Facility is the first example of CERN Oper Lab Intel collaboration. Uh, the project is now including a fellow who is supporting the development and testing of the reduction facility, and uh, Intel is actively taking part in the project. The uh, sponsoring of CERN fellow is uh, currently included in the project. And that completes my talk for today. Questions for Matteo? Okay, um, I think we're a little bit over. Uh, nobody has any questions about uh, the last talk? Okay, well then, uh, thanks everybody. Thanks, Mateo, Victor, Jim. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.